that's been being good uh, to Tom. And uh, let me let me uh, thanks uh, uh, Sarah Spencer to be there to be in Barcelona. I, I know that uh, she she will be very busy in Barcelona uh, with uh, other commitment also. And I'm very grateful that you uh, to share with uh, with uh, EMED and and uh, master students. Uh, you thought about uh, cities and irregulars and how to manage from the cities uh, irregular uh, migrants and so on. Um, let me introduce uh, um, Sarah Spencer, is a senior fellow at the Center of Migration Policy and Society, uh, which is well known as uh, COMPASS, uh, uh, University of uh, Oxford, and also uh, Director of Global Exchange on Migration and Diversity. Uh, research interests focus on integration theory and policy on migrants with irregular status, which will be the main framework of the, of the lecture today, and also on policy making processes uh, uh, related to migration. Uh, she has also a very long uh, 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 biography that uh, will, I will just leave you uh, to see in the, in the website. But in any case, um, uh, just to frame the lecture in 2012 and 14, uh, she held an open society fellowship to study national and local authority responses to migrants with irregular status in Europe. Uh, and, and to work also led to the first formal engagement between European cities on this issue. I think uh, from this point of view, uh, we are very grateful that uh, we, can, uh, we can, and she can share with us the uh, uh, outcome of this, uh, on this uh, important topic. And uh, I am fully aware that this topic is not only uh, important for the migration studies and migration research agenda, but also uh, it is something connected with the policy agenda also. And then from this point of view, I am sure that uh, we will have uh, opportunity to speak from a research and policy uh, point of view uh, on, the, on this uh, important issue. Thank you, Sarah, to be there. And thank you also, Yemet, to, uh, to host uh, Sarah. Uh, Spencer, and uh, just to, uh, to leave you to the floor. Rika, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, my thanks are due to you, it's not the other way around, and to Imed for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here to talk about the work that we've done, but also I hope very much to learn from you. I'm looking forward most of all to the session at the end where you tell me where I've got it wrong and, and uh, what I should do differently. Uh, Ricard says that the, as the master students here actually have a, res a duty to do a critique after the lecture, so do share it with me before you go. I shall be interested uh, to hear. Uh, as Ricard says, I'm going to talk about uh, the conditions that drive cities uh, and to an extent national governments to have a level of inclusive response towards migrants with irregular status. In particular, how the rationale for that, the reasons for that are framed by policymakers. How do they explain why they are adopting uh, inclusive measures um, and at the city level are doing so within the context of a largely restrictive national policy framework? And because what they do at city level diverges from the national level, it leads to tensions in the multi-level governance uh, on this issue. Uh, but also, as we found in our research, to cities doing certain things to try to avoid those tensions through low visibility provision. Um, I will try to give you a coherent and authoritative and persuasive uh, argument on this, but I'm going to end by suggesting that the research we've done raises far more questions than it answers, and hopefully, therefore, leave you with um, a research agenda. As Rika said, just to explain, I'm from uh, Compass, uh, which is a multidisciplinary research centre in Oxford. It was set up in 2003 by a team of us, uh, led by Stephen Vertevec, who I think was one of your lecturers uh, recently. Uh, at that time, I came in from the policy world, and I found the University of Oxford not terribly receptive to people who were interested in policy. They were just a bit sniffy about that. But uh, in recent years, something rather interesting has happened in the funding of UK universities. 25% of the funding from public government source is now based on evidence that the university has had an impact outside of academia. So suddenly, Oxford, like everywhere else, is rather interested in how you do have an impact, and that has opened the way to being more actively uh, involved with policymakers and practitioners, as well, of course, 
as, as doing the, hopefully, authoritative academic work. But because of that shift towards having an impact, we set up the Global Exchange on Migration and Diversity, which I run, which tries to secure an impact through knowledge exchange. So instead of the old model of disseminating our findings, we now try to engage much more actively with policymakers and practitioners uh, so that there is a two-way exchange, and we learn um, a lot from them, they learn from each other, and hopefully they learn something from us. So that slide really just tells you where um, I'm coming from, and the work that I'm going to talk about is both the research that we've done, uh, but also the knowledge exchange with cities, including Barcelona, uh, which is ongoing at the moment. So the two studies that I'm going to draw on are, first of all, the one that Rita mentioned when I was an Open Society Fellow with uh, the possibility to travel in Europe and uh, talk to policymakers about service provision to irregular migrants. And it was exploring the extent of it, the rationales for provision uh, in Europe. And then the second study was a sort of in-depth study looking in the UK at the particular issue of local authorities, municipalities, that have a statutory duty to protect children in need regardless of their immigration status. And that sets up a whole lot of tensions with national governments, which we uh, explored. But on the other side, you can see there, we're also involved in this knowledge exchange project, CIMA is the City Initiative on Irregular Migrants in Europe, uh, involving nine cities and two other cities as associate members. And they meet uh, four times over two years to share their experience, to learn from each other but in particular to produce guidance for other municipalities on how to navigate this really difficult political water of providing a level of services to irregular uh, migrants in a very difficult climate. Uh, cities have talked to each other for years about integration of regular migrants, but until we started doing this, uh, I think uh, I wouldn't be uh, corrected if I say, had never actually formally sat down and talked to each other uh, before on this rather more difficult issue, which was much more sensitive to talk about. So now they're doing that, they're producing this uh, guidance, um, and they're also hoping to raise awareness of the challenges that cities uh, face. When we talk about irregular migrants, who do we mean? Well, uh, non-EU citizens, of course, who have in some way not fulfilled their conditions of entry or stay. Some come without permission, but many, of course, enter legally to work, join family study, seek refuge, but then don't comply in some way with the conditions of their visas or overstay. And they're then irregular, undocumented if you prefer, um, unauthorized, um, and uh, often subject to deportation uh, for having done so. How many people are there? The data is really problematic, as you probably know. In fact, the last authoritative estimate, the clandestino study, 10 years ago, uh, estimated 0.4 to 0.8% of the population of the then EU 27. <coughs> but of course, uh, that's a low figure, but the issue is that people are concentrated in some areas, some cities, and some neighborhoods. Um, and I think uh, it was Dirk who estimated that uh, in Ghent, Genoa, Rotterdam, some other cities, a much higher percentage, 3 to 6%, perhaps. Um, of people with irregular status. But to be honest, we don't really know. What we do know is, of course, that the crisis, uh, refugee crisis, if we call it that, or the arrival of many people across the Mediterranean is expected to swell the numbers of people who are here without permission. Why? Because when their asylum claims are refused, uh, it's known that many will not return. The current return rate on average from Europe is well below 50%, 36% in fact. And therefore, those who are not here with permission, uh, many of them will stay. And there's a surprising myopia like in the, uh, at a European level and at a national level as what is going to happen to these people who will be in limbo, who will be living here, who will need health services, the kids will need to go to school, and what provision are we going to make for that? However, when I started off looking at this issue, the paradox that really 
uh, engaged me in it was the fact that in governments do make some provision for irregular migrants to add access to services. And that surprised me. It seemed that, um, in a sense, despite all the rhetoric about these are illegal immigrants, they're not supposed to be here, we're going to catch them and deport them, particularly perhaps in northern European countries, but not in exclusively, one of the major priorities of the European Union to do that. And at the same time, following the financial crisis, austerity, cuts in welfare provision, which we know from research disproportionately impact on migrants. So in that climate, wouldn't you expect that irregular migrants would be the last to benefit from any access to welfare provision? And yet, uh, if we look at what national governments are doing, we find that there is a certain minimal, but nevertheless, level of access to services, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment, and where the law is very restrictive, we find regional and municipal governments actually resisting that and wanting to do more. Now, for a long time, we've known and seen in the literature that there was a tension between the formal exclusion of irregular migrants and informal inclusion, of course, through their networks of family and community, or the informal discretion of service providers making it possible for people to have a level of inclusion. But once you're talking about the law providing a level of access to the welfare state or policy, then actually, as uh, Shubha and Garcia Mascarena said, what you're seeing is formal exclusion and formal inclusion. And as they put it, the state appears to validate a breach of its own sovereignty. And that seems an odd thing to do. So the project, in a sense, set out to find out why that is the case. Of course, there was a lot in the academic literature to throw light on what might be happening. Um, there is a, quite a lot written, a, a well-known theory about the competing aims within the state, the trade-offs uh, in migration uh, policy, like the work of James Holyfield and Martin Roos, which say that the government is conflicted in their internal differences of priorities, um, pulling them in different directions, such as labour market, employers want more migrants, public opinion want less, government has to uh, reconcile this. So perhaps we shouldn't be so surprised to find the same tensions and trade-offs between the national and the local level. And then indeed we know that at the sub-state level, whether regional or uh, city level, uh, there are different territorial interests, as Ricard uh, writes about, different uh, remits, mandates, responsibilities, different pressures and constraints. Um, so we might expect uh, from that to find, perhaps at the local level, that inclusion um, is a higher priority uh, than enforcement. The different framing of the problem at the local level leads to different suggestions for solution, and that in turn leads to tensions in multi-level governance that Peter Scholten uh, and others have written about in relation to the integration of regular migrants. And there's literature about all the local factors that shape local policy in relation largely to regular uh, migrants, including some arguing very much this is a pragmatic thing, that municipalities are led by very pragmatic economic and social pressures to do things, and others like Schiller and Hoekstra who say, actually, no, it's more to do with ideology and the sort of city visionary and the way they see the city and their perception of the position of migrants uh, within it. And then a particular bit of literature that seemed to me likely to be relevant, and indeed we found it was, was the work of Virginie Gouradon about policy making on migration, where she makes this wonderful distinction between the sunshine uh, policy making or the sunshine uh, politics in relation to enforcement activity. Essentially, whenever governments are talking about enforcement, they're happy to talk loudly and brightly about it in the sunshine. But if they're talking about migrants' rights, it tends to be low visibility, what you call the shadow politics of migrants' rights. And it seemed likely that when we started looking at irregular migrants, it was the shadow politics that we were likely uh, to find at play, or indeed non-decisions, where things happen not because somebody's decided to do something, uh, but because um, a, a decision was very carefully and consciously not taken um, at all which indeed we found, but just to say 
how we set about it. We looked in this first study at the pattern of entitlements in national law across the EU 28 and looked to see whether in the uneven geography of entitlements in relation to health and education there were any underlying factors that we could find to explain it. We then looked uh, in some countries at entitlements at regional and particularly at the local level and then at the rationales that were given uh, for entitlements, always bearing in mind that what policymakers say is the reason why they're doing it and what is written down or what they say in an interview isn't necessarily uh, an, uh, a mirror reflection of the actual drivers that have led to it, but it can be the closest that we can get to finding out why it's happened. We looked at how the decision was taken and how the provision is made, whether directly, for instance, by a municipality or indirectly through voluntary organisations, through NGOs. And finally, we looked to see who are the external and internal actors in the process. It was complicated uh, to do the mapping. We essentially were fortunate that the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European <coughs> Union had already done some mapping of health and education um, and other entitlements, and so we were able to update that using uh, academic and uh, grey literature. And then we, we, so we did the mapping ourselves and then had experts within each of the 28 uh, uh, countries check that for us to make sure that we got it right, and we published the report on that in 2015. And in it, there is an annex in which the entitlements to health and education for irregular migrants are set out uh, individually for every country and then analysed in the main report. We then did uh, interviews across 14 member states, which we chose on the basis of, first of all, whether entry or stay is a criminal offence. Uh, we assumed that that was likely to affect the response at the national and local level, uh, and therefore had some countries that where it is a criminal offence and some where it isn't. We looked at the size of the irregular migrant population. We thought it was possible that where there are a lot of irregular migrants, you might be more likely to find services. On the other hand, it's more costly if there are a lot, so you might be less likely to find them. So we looked at these different criteria. And then at the different level of autonomy of municipalities and the differing regional uh, contexts. And we did more than 100 interviews with policymakers and others, of which 61 were with policymakers. And then we tried to uh, support that by looking at documentary evidence, which in some cases is available and in many cases isn't, for reasons that I'll get to. The study um, was facilitated by the EuroCities uh, Working Group on Migration and Integration, and they came together at some point to, in 2013 to discuss it, and that led to a workshop uh, here in Barcelona in 2014, where they formally came together for the first time to talk about it. And that led, in turn, to us having this larger uh, initiative for knowledge exchange between the 11 cities that's ongoing at the moment, say of which Barcelona is one, uh, which is preparing this guidance for municipalities on how to deal with this uh, difficult topic. In the research, there were many challenges in doing it. In relation to the entitlements, it's naturally very complex to look at the different legal provisions across 28 states. But it was complicated by the fact that the entitlement is often not explicit in the law. Uh, so uh, in 10 member states, for instance, the right to go to school for a child with a regular status is written there in the law. It actually says, regardless of immigration status, you can go to school. But in all, there are five where there's no right at all, but in the rest, it's simply implicit. All children have the right to go to school, and then from which irregular migrant children are not excluded. That's difficult because it means there's nothing written down. There's no debate in Parliament, there's no report which says why well, I should go to school. So it's difficult to find uh, the rationale evidence uh, in those cases that's actually written down. And then when we come to the interviews, the rationale that were given by policymakers. Uh, may not be the whole story. In their sort of rhetorical framing, they may uh, emphasise more those arguments which uh, gain greater attraction or thought to be more persuasive, um, and it's difficult uh, to get the um, <coughs> sense of the extent to which the reasons you're given are actually the drivers that led to it. But nevertheless, it's a very important 
uh, set of evidence on what the drivers are. If we look at the mapping now, still talking at the national level, you see that there is a very uneven geography of entitlement in relation to these two key services, health and education, across the EU. But all EU states allow a level of access to health care, all allow access to emergency care, although it's true to say some may charge for it. But what was interesting was the extent to which eight or ten member states allow access to primary care, some to hospital care, maternity, a lot do for treatment for infectious diseases, and a number of countries provide full care for children, which actually can take you into very interesting arguments about deservingness. Why are children treated differently? What's the argument there um, that leads to them getting greater provision? Schools I've already mentioned. But what stood out in the mapping was the number of cases where there has been a recent extension of access, in a way quite the opposite of what you would have expected in the current climates. Sweden is perhaps the best example, because in 2013, having gone from a very, very restrictive system, they decided to open up access to health care uh, to uh, any care which cannot be postponed, whatever that means, and doctors interpret it differently. Uh, Spain here is a good example in that you have your special residence permit for uh, irregular migrants who are victims of domestic violence. And that reflected a tension actually within the national government between, I think, believe it was the equality department that said, look, we've got this target on domestic violence and we're not going to achieve it if that group out there can't come forward and report the experience that they've had. So you have to enable them to report it and give them some protection, uh, otherwise they won't. And then even in the UK, which on the whole, the trend is in the other direction towards more restriction, in 2012, they took the decision to allow access to free treatment for HIV. Why did this happen? Well, the Swedish example is interesting. In Sweden, NGOs had set up a parallel system of healthcare using voluntary doctors and nurses to come to clinics a couple of times a week to provide care for regular migrants. And that, uh, in a sense, offended the Swedish sense of propriety about how public services ought to be provided. Uh, there was no continuity of medical care because there were no records. They were troubled by, essentially, the, the administrative and the quality of care and the, the, the medical ethics uh, involved in turning people away from the mainstream health services. And so in the report that was written, which is one of the rare examples where the rationale is completely spelled out, they argued strongly that the healthcare should be delivered on the same basis as for the rest of uh, the population. Uh, not, not as much as, well actually the report argued that it should and the government of course didn't quite go that far. Um, but the argument was that it should be on the same basis. When we look at the UK example in relation to HIV, there the argument was that you can't prevent the spread of HIV if you have a section of the population who do not come forward for, for uh, being assessed and for treatment. That, in a sense, the public health argument was overwhelming. And there was a row between the Department of Health, who obviously were persuaded by that argument, and the Home Office, our interior ministry, who were not persuaded. They thought it would lead to lots of uh, health tourism. But the evidence... Uh, was compelling and essentially there was a simple good example of a trade-off where one uh, department, one set of evidence, one policy priority actually uh, trumped the enforcement rationale which normally uh, wins. So those are interesting examples of trade-offs within national government and in relation to this issue and recognition at national level, government level that some provision has to be made. However, uh, get back to reality, the, real, the policy norm uh, is highly restrictive. And that creates policy challenges for local government, which is the main focus of what I want to say. So at the local level, the exclusion of regular migrants, let's say, presents issues that can't be ignored. In Utrecht, 2012, it was people camping on the outskirts of the city homelessness, very visible street homelessness, and all the health issues and addiction issues to which that can lead. Here in Barcelona, 
uh, many issues, but one of them was people living in abandoned industrial buildings. I think there were public safety issues there, and uh, the city council had to take a series of steps in order to provide alternative accommodation. Berlin, for over a couple of years, had this very visible uh, protest right in the centre, the heart of the city, by former asylum seekers and asylum seekers uh, that was disruptive uh, and at the heart of the cultural district. And then most recently, our terrible tragedy, Grenfell Tower, that's the tower block in central London that you, I'm sure, know uh, suffered from a terrible fire that cost the lives of uh, more than 70 uh, people. Now, one of the things that happened after that was that the NGOs reported that many people, some people, were uh, unwilling to come forward to say that they had been victims of this, to <coughs> say what services they now needed, or to give evidence about what had happened. Why? Because of their irregular status, they thought that it would result in them being deported. And it actually <coughs> led to the government having to issue an amnesty, a temporary amnesty, to allow those people to stay. And when it wasn't for a long enough time and people didn't come forward, they then had to extend it so that people would come forward to report the situation they were in. And when we did the field work on the project, we found indeed that local priorities in relation to irregular migrants can differ from those of national governments. There's example uh, from a Dutch city, uh, from a health worker explaining why they provide health services that were not provided uh, nationally, not just saying that the government doesn't understand the situation we face, but actually almost, you know, they don't care, they're not aware of it, uh, they're not faced with the challenges that we have every day, so they understand it, think about it differently from the way we do. And here this Greek city politician working out some convoluted reasoning for why they provide food for irregular migrants. So yes, we have to follow the law. The law says very specifically we are not allowed to provide food for irregular migrants. The food bank can only be for uh, people who are allowed to be in the city. On the other hand, the law might say that, but if people don't eat, they steal, and that's breaking the law, and therefore we need to provide food in order, in that sense, to uphold uh, the law. So cities are providing a whole range of services beyond, let's say, national expectations. Healthcare, sometimes paying for services that governments won't pay for. Nursery education, because the law might only provide for education of compulsory school age. Shelter, a major issue, because the law is so uh, restrictive. Um, legal advice and representation. This is interesting, because while some cities are, in a sense, providing services that just put an elastoplast over the problem. They're just trying to alleviate the worst of the trouble. Other cities are making sure that people have access to legal advice and representation so that they can actually try to solve the underlying problem. And Utrecht has astonishing statistics on the success of that approach. Over the past 10 years, over 90% of the people to whom they have secured access to legal advice have either secured the right to stay which is the case in most cases, simply by providing evidence, by providing a better case, or have been reconnected with their home country, or have been accepted by the government as in need of provision uh, as an asylum seeker. So that problem-solving approach, as opposed to just provide the service and hope the problem goes away, has proved very successful. Cities are sometimes providing language classes, as here in Barcelona, birth certificates, uh, often actually with a national provision that that's okay, um, but cities actually making it happen. If you don't provide a birth certificate, then how do you know how many people are living in your city? And that's one of the rationales that we were given. So not a humanitarian or human rights reasoning, but just a pragmatic, how can we plan if we don't know who's here? Very occasionally, skills training, job search. I say occasionally because, of course, in a way that's the very antithesis of what irregular migrants are supposed to have. They're not supposed to be able to work. Um, local ID cards, very rare. Uh, and safe reporting for victims of crime. An interesting example, Amsterdam uh, actually adopted a formal policy of saying we won't ask about immigration status and if we find out about it, we won't do anything about it. 
if it's a victim or witness of crime, because it's more important to us to have access to that information. Of course, we want to protect them as victims, but also we really want the intelligence that they can provide who the criminals are, and that helps us in crime prevention and detection. And what's interesting in the Netherlands is that that was Amsterdam's policy, and it's now the Dutch policy. So it's an interesting example of policy making from the bottom up, um, as opposed to what we often think is it's always the other way down. Now, these services are sometimes provided directly by the city administration, by the staff who are providing the services to everybody else. Often, though, they are provided through NGOs because of the arm's length legal and political advantages of doing it in that way. So when we asked cities, why are you providing these services to irregular migrants, this is the range of reasons that we were given. It's because we need to tackle street homelessness. We need to tackle street sleeping. We can't do that unless we include this group because of crime prevention. We want to protect them, but we also want the information. The image of the city, a strong economic reason, tourism. It isn't helpful for tourism if people are sleeping on the streets. It's not good for business investment. Public health, although also often used as a, as a shield, as a rationale, not because irregular migrants are more likely to be harmful uh, to public health, but because it's one of those reasons that actually wins support. Domestic violence, you can't uh, reduce it if people won't come forward. Resolving status, as I mentioned it. And then this whole thing about managing public services, needing accurate data, why people are encouraged to register in the padron here. And then the pressure on emergency services. If you don't have access to primary care services, then you go to the emergency department, um, and that uh, creates problems uh, there. And these are the kind of reasons we were given uh, here uh, in Catalonia. So registration in the Padron is essential, so we have information on people in the area, so a public administration uh, argument. Uh, interestingly, clearing the streets to make them suitable for all residents uh, and make the city attractive for tourism. It's part of the reason why services are provided to street prostitutes with a regular status. That, of course, is not the reason why the staff who are doing it are providing that. They may be doing it from compassionate humanitarian reasons. But when the city itself decided to put money into that, that was a part of the, or the key reason why they decided to do it. And then the social cohesion argument very, very worried about their integration, don't want a divided society, don't want people living in ghettos without connection with the majority of the society, because that ends up uh, in divisions. And it's interesting that argument came from a regional official and makes me um, wonder, uh, and particularly also because of Rika's book about uh, uh, regional uh, politics and multi-level governance, to what extent the cities are their framing is shaped by the framing at the regional level, and to what extent it's different because of the own territorial interests, own pressures and uh, constraints, um, in which case there is a, a multi-level governance tension there as well, um, which will be the case in some uh, regional areas, uh, say Ghent in, in the Flemish part of Belgium, for instance. I've emphasized the socioeconomic kinds of rationale that the city have given, but of course there are uh, humanitarian uh, reasons as well. But it, what struck me was that one might expect that it's humanitarian reasons, passionate feelings about human rights, uh, principles and law that might lead the most liberal cities uh, to be inclusive of regular migrants. But what comes over time and time again is the more pragmatic socioeconomic rationale um, because the city cannot deliver on its other priorities if irregular migrants are excluded. That said, humanitarian and human rights arguments are raised as well, particularly uh, for children. Um, and this example, uh, this quote here from the Dutch city, uh, illustrates also helpfully that while officials may feel most strongly a certain set of reasons, in this case, worried about public order and disorder, uh, their judgment was that for the po politicians it was the humanitarian reasoning uh, which was at the forefront uh, of their minds. <clears throat>
So if we were to categorize the drivers of inclusion, uh, we could put the legal duty uh, first. There are instances, like in the UK, providing for children in need where it is actually a legal duty which is leading to the provision. But we also found that being used as a shield. If a city wants to make provision for irregular migrants, if it can find a legal duty that it can use as a justification, that is very helpful. And in, in the case of Dutch cities, for instance, using the European Social Charter to say, well, these international human rights standards actually say that we need to make provision. Um, so, uh, sorry, government, but you may not think we should, but these international standards suggest we should. And then actually being party to some uh, litigation or complaint to the Social uh, Charter Committee uh, in order to get the decision they wanted to justify the provision they wanted uh, to make. Economic factors, strong. Social policy factors like public health, cohesion, strong. Cultural values, the city imaginary, the way in which they see themselves. So if you're a human rights city, that's part of your perception as officials and politicians about uh, where the position is of migrants within it. And then these governance and administrative reasons that I mentioned. Interestingly, uh, party political factors, much more limited. It's not by any means the case that it's cities controlled uh, by the left uh, or the centre-left uh, that are responsible for these measures. I think there's an example here in Barcelona from 2010 when you had a government that was centre-right but they maintained the right. The uh, provision here um, in Sweden, the health uh, measures were introduced by a centre-right government and were pushed for by centre-right parties at the local and regional level. On the other hand, we've got examples from Germany where it was only when an SPD Green coalition came in that the measures could come in. So it's simply, it's not the case that it's all one way. Uh, party politics plays a role, but it does seem to be the case that the imperatives that drive this at city level are sufficiently strong to make it happen, even when it's not centre-left parties in control. So what happens when there's a divergence between what cities are doing and what the national government thinks they ought to be doing? We know from the literature on integration policies that uh, this can go in a number of ways. Peter Scholten's work categorized four different types of relationship between central and local government in relation to integration. It can be centralized, where essentially central government says this is what you need to do. Local government is comfortable with that. Uh, coordination is effective. And essentially, is what he calls policy frame convergence. They both agree what needs to be done. And it's relatively um, uh, harmonized. Similarly, the, when it's localised, there's a mutual acceptance that a certain issue is a local competence and the municipality is left to get on with it. Then he's what he calls multi-level governance, which is where there's a shared competence on the issue and a, the outcome has to be negotiated and the framing of the issue has to be negotiated until it's shared. But then he comes to his fourth category, which he calls decoupling, where essentially central and local do not agree. There is not a shared framing of what the problem is and therefore what the solution should be. And more than that, there's a lack of a mechanism to resolve those differences of view, and that leads to conflict and litigation. And I thought we might expect to find that decoupling would have a particular resonance in relation to irregular migrants. And to a certain extent, we did. There is a great deal of tension about it in some countries, leading to litigation, the Netherlands, Italy, for instance, and the UK, where municipalities are uh, either arguing to be able to do more than they're allowed to do by national law, or in the case of the UK, arguing that as the national law requires them to do it, central government should contribute towards uh, the cost of it. The lack of mechanisms for resolving these issues other than through the courts um, has led to the conflict being overt although in the Netherlands, having had court cases, but a long period of negotiation, uh, which almost led to the fall of the government in 2015. So this is not some marginal issue. Um, they are now near agreement. What we found was extremely interesting in 
the ways in which the cities are handling this, though, is they want, in many cases, to avoid conflict where they can <coughs> and are doing a lot of things to avoid that decoupling erupting into an overt uh, political or legal row. One thing that's happening is rules being stretched to enable provision. One wonderful example I was given by um, a German uh, politician uh, in Berlin, actually, was that um, in relation to birth certificates. Now, in Germany, officials who come into contact with somebody with a regular status have a statutory duty to report that to the immigration authorities. If that's the case, you cannot go to register your child's birth. Berlin City wanted them to be able to do that. On the other hand, German are great respecters of rules, so what could they do? Her solution was to instruct the birth registrars to be very slow about passing on that report. It was stretching the rule, it wasn't breaking it, it was just simply saying be very slow about it so that families will be able to come forward and eventually, okay, their details will be reported, but by then they can have moved on. Uh, there are lots of examples, uh, different kinds of examples, informal arrangements where the police know perfectly well that this is a health centre for irregular migrants, or a school where there are irregular migrants, but choose not to police near that area so that, uh, th choose not, of course, they police in other ways, but not uh, to ask questions about immigration uh, status. Or the Greek example of the food bank, uh, simply having enough food there so that after everybody's gone, the irregular migrants uh, can come in, stretching the rule but not breaking it. <coughs> but there are also examples where a city administration is providing a service directly, not through an NGO, but directly, as in the case of this Danish city where they employ outreach workers to go and work with homeless people to help them resolve their status or to find their way home or whatever it is, to find shelter. Uh, but within the city administration, there's no policy, there's no budget, nothing is written down. So the managers know the staff are employed to do that, but there is no formal recognition of it because that would be awkward. And this social worker whom I interviewed said this is the most difficult thing by, of, about my job. I'm sort of both accepted and not accepted and that's an uncomfortable position to be. And of course, for NGOs, it's also problematic. Uh, it's all right if, as in this case, you're a long-term NGO, you've been doing this for years, you know where to send someone for healthcare or where they'll get uh, shelter because you know who's flexible. But that's no good for the NGO that doesn't deal with this very often. It's no good for the migrant family who doesn't know where to go. So people are operating in this gray zone of uh, low visibility provision. Um, and I think one of the questions that we might discuss is how sustainable that is as a long-term way of uh, operating. And then the other way in which cities do this in a low visibility way is through NGOs, um, which politically is at a distance, legally is helpful because even if the city has a duty to pass on information, the NGO doesn't. Um, and uh, it, of course, can help in other ways, and the NGOs are closer to the people uh, concerned. I was intrigued by this Finnish example where an NGO that wanted money from the city to set up a day centre said, don't worry, we will only provide this service to regular people who have a right to be in Finland. And the city said to them, actually, if we give you the money, our condition will be is that you don't ask, because they were experiencing a problem of people coming to the city services who weren't entitled to them, but didn't know where else to send them. So this NGO was very helpfully, in a sense, going to provide that. And here, that Dutch city integration official just acknowledging that the politics of this, that NGOs provide services in gray areas, not too many people are aware of it. If it's not too visible, it's okay. Before I finish, just to mention this second study, uh, which was an in-depth study on municipal responses in the UK on one particular issue, and that's their statutory duty to provide a limited amount of shelter and support 
to children and effectively therefore their parents who are what's called in need. And if you're destitute, you are in need. Essentially what we've got here is a tension between immigration controls which exclude people from welfare as a way of trying to manage migration on the one hand and the conflicting policy objective of protecting the rights and welfare of the child. This local authority duty precedes the issue of irregular migrants. It's a duty that's there on the statute book from 1989 uh, and no one had in mind at the time that immigration status would be an issue. But as the courts began to look at this issue, it says all children. It doesn't say <coughs> children with regular status and therefore local authorities you have to provide. Um, and uh, we looked at whether they do provide and why it is that municipals, municipalities actually respond to these families in such different ways. We looked at who the families are, what leads them to ask support, what their experiences were. We were particularly looking at why there are variations in practices, what the significance of NGO involvement is, and at the relationship with the Home Office, because while the local authority is dealing with the children and families, they have a duty to support them until the Home Office resolves the immigration status. So there's an inherent tension here between the local and the national state, uh, because the more months and the months build up that the local authorities are looking after these families, albeit at a very low level, uh, they are paying for that uh, until the Home Office are able to resolve the status issue. It was a, a large study, survey, social service departments, eight research areas where we did a lot of interviews and also with NGOs. What did we find? that here the driver of the provision is certainly the legal duty. That provides the framing of it, that's why they're doing it. But the staff attitudes towards the cases the, when they come through the door and NGO representation proves very significant in how people are actually uh, assessed and responded uh, to. In essence, while some authorities gave primacy to the rights of the child, which of course is what the law says, Others were very, very aware of the sense of deservingness or undeservingness of the parents because of their irregular status. And we found there was a lot of gatekeeping at the very point that the person comes through the door before their needs were ever assessed because local authorities said, once we start to assess their needs, we inevitably end up having to make provision. So if we don't want to make provision, then the best thing to do is to stop them ever getting that far. Now, this Section 17 is supposed to be an emergency measure because, after all, most people have access to the welfare state. So it's a small fund supposed to be to help people just in that transition, perhaps from homelessness into shelter or poverty, into the welfare state. But these families have no access to the welfare state. So we found uh, almost 10% of families being supported for more than three years um, and a third for more than a year, and it out adds up to quite a lot of money, 28 million a year. We found that before receiving support, many people had been self-sufficient, but gradually their irregular status had caught up with them and they had become destitute, and some had experienced terribly exploitative relations in return, for instance, for being given a roof over their head. But the local authorities, in trying to resolve these cases, and therefore no longer have to pay for these families, found communication with central government absolutely very, very poor. Very difficult to get anybody on the phone, very difficult to get an answer, and the months and months would go on uh, without being able uh, to resolve it. So municipalities literally were caught between their duty to safeguard children on the one hand and their inability to resolve the underlying cause of their destitution. And it seems an extraordinary, in a sense, dysfunctional relationship with two parts of the state uh, to be uh, operating in that way. If their social workers' attitudes were framed, uh, the deservingness, sense of deservingness uh, or undeservingness of parents influenced their response to an extent to these families. They said that in part, their sense of deservingness came from the tenor and the tone of the national debate and the way in which the government itself 
uh, talked about uh, this client group. So, what does this tell us? It tells us that there are indeed uh, tensions and trade-offs in managing irregular migrants, both within national states, undoubtedly within the states, national states themselves, but also between national states and local uh, tiers. And that reflects their differing remits, uh, pressures, constraints, their framing of those uh, issues that they face, which is affected by their values, perceptions of deservingness, and we might say they're the city imaginary. Legal, economic, social, cultural governance factors all drive local responses. Um, the needs of the city, not primarily those of migrants. The local policy divergence leads to tensions and decoupling in the vertical multi-level governance, which can sometimes lead to national policy change but it does also lead, interestingly, to the avoidance of conflict through low visibility uh, provision, stretching the rules, avoiding a paper trail, uh, and provision through NGOs. So we might say that the multi-level governance both shapes local responses uh, and is shaped by them. That leaves many, many questions unanswered uh, and future research agenda. Uh, which I could talk about, but I think we've run out of time and I will leave it there. But I think just refer to the final question there. It seems to me there's an interesting philosophical, if perhaps legal question, uh, the one that Linda Bosniak puts. If we do provide services, if we accept the rationale for a level of service provision uh, in national law and at city level to irregular migrants, how much should that be? Uh, how far should cities go? Are we talking about full equal uh, rights here? And if not, what's the grounds for providing less? And the way Linda Bosniak put it is, when is it legitimate to restrict rights as part of immigration control? And when should the equality principle uh, prevail? And it seems to me the underlying question, which is very difficult uh, to resolve, um, but uh, cannot be resolved entirely on pragmatic grounds. Thank you very much for your... <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk and, and uh, to frame uh, very clearly uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, most of the issues related to local policy and irregular providing service. And I think uh, now it's, it's time to, to have some questions and, and to open the debate. Maybe we can do that in two or three, and yes. then we can... And do two, debate. Yeah, two, yes. two or three around. Yeah. <clears throat>